Hello and welcome to our third chorus forum. Today's event is titled Making the Future of Open Research Work. And I'm Howard Ratner, the Executive Director of Chorus. And I'll be your host for today, along with Tara Packer overseeing the QA and also our wonderful speakers and moderators. If you wanna tweet about anything that you hear today, feel free and use the hashtag chorus forum. So a little bit about Chorus. I won't take too much of your time about this, but today's event fits very nicely in with our Chorus 2021 goals. So we are a not-for-profit community of publishers, institutions, and funders dedicated to making open research work since 2013. Our aim is to help our stakeholders scale their OA compliance efforts. And we're working to develop metrics about open data and we help our stakeholders improve the quality of their metadata related to open research. And most recently, we've been hosting forums and workshops, similar to the summit um, that we're here today to connect the stakeholders so that they can learn and hopefully build trust. So today's agenda is made up in multiple parts. So, so we're gonna have a little bit of a warm up exercise, which we'll start in a second. And then we'll follow up with session one, which is the new OA models moderated by David Crotty, senior consultant for Clark and Esposito. We'll then take a break from 12.15 to 12.30. And in that break, I'll give you a little exercise to do, which will set up our panel discussion, what infrastructure is needed to make open research work, which will be moderated by Alex Vance, chief executive officer for AIP Publishing, and also the chair of Chorus. At 1.15, I'll come back and we'll do some closing remarks. And we'll also do then an exit poll. One thing to mention as regarding QA today, uh, because we're using the Zoom web webinar feature, we have the virtue of having the QA button. So please use the QA button and that will then bring up a QA window. Type your question into the bottom of the QA window. And if you like a question that's already there, you're welcome to upvote it. If you have any problems or anything else, use, use chat for that. I want to thank our sponsors for today's event, our gold sponsors, ACS, AIP Publishing, Wiley, and our silver sponsors, AMS, the American Meteorological Society, Silver Chair, and STM. So here's our warm-up exercise. So if you all go to, to this URL, and that will be pasted in the, in the chat, I will then show this on the window. So here on, on Menti, you're going to be asked, how aware are you about these the new OA models that you're gonna hear in session one? So go ahead and, and rate your familiarity with these. So I can see that it's shaping up. And we can see that some people are more familiar with the read and publish and lots learn more about CAP. So Sarah, you've got some teaching to do. I'll see what it, when it settles down just a little bit. ADA people have responded. That's a really good number. I'm gonna, I'm gonna stop the share and I'm gonna move back to the presentation so we can get session one underway, but we can get a sense of the audience there for our session one speakers. So David Crotty, over to you, over to session one. Okay, um, thanks Howard. Uh, and thanks to everyone for joining us today. Um, back when we were first putting together this session, um, we were really trying to focus on the operationalization of the move to open access. So, I mean, we, we've been talking about open access for more than 20 years now, and, and we're really uh, finally, I think, past that tipping point where it's gone from, wow, that's a really good idea that maybe we'll get to someday, to being in a period of active experimentation as that shift is taking place. Um, 
but that word experimentation implies uncertainty. And we really don't yet know the best ways to make open access publishing of research results sustainable and robust over the long term. Um, the model that the community has the most experience with, uh, having you know the individual author paying an article processing charge, works pretty well. I mean, well, I mean, it works well for some authors in some subject areas in some geographies, but it's clearly not a universal solution to making open access work, and it creates some new inequities as it resolves others. So what we need is to try other routes to uh, better understand what works, where it works, and for whom it works in order to build a diverse ecosystem of open access publishing models that can support the many different needs of the many different members of the research community. But that's not an easy undertaking. Um, launching a new business model, figuring out how to make it work, getting buy-in from the community can be a long and arduous task with a lot of heavy lifting. Um, so what we really want to ask today with our panel is, is, is how we as a community can lighten that load. Um, and, and today's panel will, will offer the perspective from three different publishers who are deeply engaged in experimenting with new models. Um, I've asked them each to briefly explain the model they're working with, and then really to talk about the work they've had to do to develop it and maintain it, keep it, keep it uh, moving forward. Um, after that, we'll hear from a university librarian who is um, active in working with publishers to bring those new models to the researchers. Um, and we'll hear about the work that's needed from that perspective. So what I want you to think about as you listen today um, is where we can come together as a community to build shared infrastructure to make their efforts and, and subsequently all of our efforts a little bit easier. Um, what can we offer to drive experiments with new models and to make those experiments efficient and successful? Um, so um, our speakers today will be uh, Scott Delman, uh, who is the Director of Publications for the Association for Computing Machinery, uh, who's going to talk about uh, the work ACM is doing with transformative agreements. Um, and I understand Scott may have to leave us a little early today, so if you have questions for Scott, do type those in uh, uh, fairly soon into the Q&A, and, and he can uh, answer there before he has to depart. Uh, Sarah Ruhi, um, the Director of Strategic Partnerships for PLOS, will talk about their Community Action Publishing uh, or CAP model. Uh, Richard Gallagher, who is the President and Editor-in-Chief for Annual Reviews, will present uh, their Subscribe to Open approach. Uh, and then Courtney Kremit, who is the Collection Strategist for Science and Engineering and Research Data at the MIT Libraries, will give us a view from the library perspective. So uh, I will turn things over to Scott and we'll uh, have a discussion at the end. Thank you, David. Uh, just a quick check on my mic and video. Is everything coming through okay? Yeah, you sound good to me. Great, thanks, David. Um, next slide. Thanks, Howard. Uh, so uh, good morning, everyone. Good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. I'm Scott Delman, I'm ACM's Director of Publications and also serving as Chair of Crossref. Um, what I'm going to talk about for the next 10 minutes or so is the model that ACM uh, created and, uh, and launched in early 2020. We actually went live with this model uh, at the end of January last year, right at the beginning of the pandemic, so perfect timing. Um, but before I jump into the details, I'm going to just quickly show you a little bit of information about ACM to set some context, um, which you can see on your screen. Um, we're one of the oldest and, and, uh, and largest computing societies in the world and, um, and are very much a, a scholarly publisher. I would say as a, as a scholarly publisher, probably considered a mid-sized publisher um, and very much a, a member organization that runs um, conferences, publications, and member benefits as well. Uh, next slide, Howard. A um, little bit of context about our publications program. Um, ACM runs its own digital library, which consists of full text and bibliographic data uh, for everything that we publish. And we also uh, run a bibliographic database called the Guide to Computing Literature, which is a Scopus-like database of, of roughly more than 3 million records. Um, we are publishing about 20 to 25,000 full text articles per year, um, just to put in context what, what we do. Next slide. So um, th this session has really been framed as, as experimentation in OA, although I think um, for ACM, we're, we're a bit past experimentation at this point. Um, we've made a decision as an organization that uh, within a five-year time frame, ACM will become an open access publisher uh, and, and we'll be using the ACM open model that I'm gonna talk about 
this morning um, as one of the main paths to get to that future. Um, but there's a very clear timeline uh, and we are about a year, year and a half into this transition and things seem to be going very well. Um, the, the, the two things that really are kind of sitting at, at, at sort of the top of the, the, uh, the, goal, the goal pyramid for us are to create a publication program uh, that can be innovative, uh, that will better serve the research community and our membership than uh, the subscription model uh, has served in the past by, uh, by opening up our publications, and putting them in front of the paywall and making sure that they get more visibility, more usage, more impact on the community. Um, but of course, to do this in a sustainable way and sustainability is really at the heart of everything that we do here. Howard, next slide. So um, first and foremost, uh, a, bit, a little bit about ACM's publications program. Um, we're about a 20 to $25 million publishing operation. Um, and if you look on the expense side, um, we're a similar number. So we're not generating an enormous uh, surplus or profit. We are a nonprofit society publisher. And so when we developed this ACM open model, it was really um, a uh, built from a, a perspective of cost sustainability, making sure that we have enough income over the long term to continue our, our publishing operations and serving our membership. One of the key infrastructure elements that we found very early on, several years ago when we started developing this model, was, uh, was the need to really have a clear understanding of our finances and to drill down to understand exactly what it costs to publish a research paper, a non-research paper, a magazine paper, uh, and taking all of the various costs and expenses uh, and overheads into consideration. So we set about doing that in, uh, in 2019, um, and uh, that culminated in, uh, in work with a group of universities uh, that we worked very collaboratively with, Iowa State University, MIT, Carnegie Mellon University, the University of Minnesota, and the University of California. Um, and once we started uh, developing the model, we really understood, we wanted to understand um, what sustainability meant for ACM because we, everyone uses that term, but for ACM, it has a very specific meaning. And when you look at your finances, you understand that one publisher is very different from every other publisher. For ACM, what that means is at, at a very base level that as we transition to OA, we need to, um, we need to be able to generate a proxy approximately 23 to $24 million a year. So everything is stemming from, from that piece. Um, infrastructure question for us was, how do we get at all of this data? We're a relatively small operation in terms of staff and resources. And so quite a lot of effort was put into understanding exactly what that financial picture looked like. Once we did that, um, we decided to be totally transparent about it to the community um, because uh, sustainability for us of course, we wanted to convey what that means to, uh, to the institutional partners that we were working with and also to uh, prospective customers down the road. So we published an article in our flagship. Uh, it was distributed in May of 2020. Uh, and if anybody's interested in seeing what that, that article looks like, I'm happy to send that. Uh, just send me an email. Howard, next slide. A um, couple of screenshots of, of uh, that article. Um, details on you know, where the revenues and expenses for ACM come from. This is gonna be fundamental uh, to understanding the model a bit. Uh, next slide, Howard. And then next slide as well, and we'll jump off of the, these screenshots. So the, the next piece for us in developing the model was really understanding two different elements. On the one hand, um, what, what did the publication data look like? Where were published articles coming from, uh, what institutions in particular were affiliated with those authors uh, and, and understanding this at a very deep level. And I will say for, for ACM, uh, the infrastructure challenge that we have here is probably the most significant that we've faced over the last two years um, in developing the model and, and continuing to run this model, uh, hopefully long into the future. And so, um, you know, what I would say is uh, as a mid-sized publisher, um, it, it took us quite some time to get at this level of, of data um, and it's not perfect. And so one of the things, the key elements uh, that we found is um, that author name normalization and institutional name normalization, the author data, metadata, and the institution data and metadata um, are, are not perfect. And that is for a variety of reasons, 
Um, but more than anything else, it's a, it's a question of creating a workflow in your production system as a publisher that makes sure that the metadata is clean and comprehensive. Um, we publish around 20 to 25,000 articles a year, but we still have um, somewhere between two and 4,000 articles a year that we can't assign to a particular institution um, because the data itself is not clean because the met metadata wasn't assigned at the publication stage. So, um, so that's one of the, kind of the key elements I think other, other publishers would probably uh, agree with. On the right side, and what you're looking at on the left side, of course, is ultimately what we came up with was a list of roughly 5,000 institutions that, uh, that publish with ACM, and we were able to assign the vast majority of those uh, to a particular institution. And, and that's relevant, of course, for our business model. On the right side of the screen um, is data relating to, uh, to your customers. And so uh, in particular, uh, what institutions are, are publishing papers with us and what institutions are paying. And one of the fundamental things that we found, one of the challenges that we found at the beginning was, uh, was that the place where our content was coming from, the, the, the institutions authoring papers for ACM um, did not very well line up with uh, with where the vast majority of our revenues were coming from. Um, put simply, we have around 2,700 institutional customers uh, and those institutions are generating all of our publications revenue. Uh, and yet when you look at where the publications come from, the vast majority, over 80 to 85% of those publications come from the top one third. When we looked at our revenues, about 70% of our revenues were coming from the bottom two thirds. So institutions that are consuming content, but are not creating content. And that's a fundamental challenge for us. And really, um, I think for any publisher that's building a sustainable business model for open access, you really need to understand that at a pretty detailed level for any kind of a read and publish model. Um, it may be a bit different for a subscribe to open model, but this is really fundamental for us. So next slide, Howard. The model itself um, is what we're calling an unlimited access and unlimited publication model. So we are not APC based uh, in the sense that we're not charging authors APCs. Uh, and uh, we are, when we say unlimited, um, we charge essentially a flat fee um, on an annual basis to an institution. And that is based, that fee is based on a tiering structure uh, that's ultimately based on publication history. So looking at the number of articles that have historically come out of an institution. Um, no fees to authors is sort of a fundamental tenet. Uh, Multi-year arrangements, uh, creative commons licensing, the ability to deposit uh, versions of record and accepted manuscripts into an institution's institutional repository. Um, and then of course, uh, keeping, keeping tiering flat for an institution over the, the term of that agreement and then using the publication data as it progresses over time to determine future tiering. Howard, next slide. Um, what you're looking at here is, is the basic model. So these are the 10 tiers, uh, largest to smallest. You're looking at the tier prices, which we're extremely transparent about. One of the, the, the key tenets of the model is global pricing. So in a subscription world, you would see um, you know, 100 different types of prices depending and discount structures depending upon which country you're selling into. Uh, but with the ACM open model, what we found is that we really want like institutions to pay the identical prices no matter where those institutions are in the world. So we've created this sort of global tiering model that's based on article output. Um, and you can see roughly in that fourth column, approximately for ACM, um, where, where that content is coming from. Uh, in terms of numbers. Roughly speaking, about 80 to 85% of what we publish comes from what is represented here on this slide as tiers one through nine, with that long tail being uh, tier 10. Um, tier 10 is in red, uh, and that's because there's a great deal of uncertainty around what will happen when those smaller institutions that consume content, but don't actually produce content for ACM, uh, when the vast majority of what we publish is sitting in front of a paywall, what happens to that tier 10? Will those institutions cancel? Uh, will those institutions stay on? I think this question is very relevant, of course, for Richard when Richard talks about subscribe to open because those are some of the same challenges that we're faced with, I think, with the subscribe to open model. Howard, next slide. Um, important to keep in mind that 
what, what we've found is that um, as a result of the model and rebalancing uh, the, the pricing and the revenues from where uh, right now where the consumers are to where the producers of content are, it means that the top roughly one third of our institutional customers are being asked to pay more than they currently pay today because they're also, they're publishing the most content. Um, for the bottom two thirds, that means that they will actually pay less. And part of our thinking with that tier 10 was, well, to mitigate the risk of cancellation, uh, we, we are gonna be reducing pricing quite dramatically over time. And we're doing that at thresholds of openness. So as more and more of our publications become open access as a result of the model, um, those institutions that aren't producing content will pay less and less. And so you see this sort of ramp down schedule and pricing um, and, and that hopefully will lead to greater sustainability. And the next slide, Howard. Some financial terms, uh, non-financial terms, um, of course, fixed pricing. Uh, we've decided not to go with the APC model uh, for a variety of reasons. One of those reasons, quite frankly, is library budgeting. Um, libraries, when they're doing their annual budgets for periodicals, they really need to understand what, what they're gonna be paying. And because article counts seem to go up and down from year to year, um, and in some cases will go up dramatically from one year to another, um, the, the predictability aspect of this was really key for, for our institutional partners. And so that, that really was the basis for um, putting into place this unlimited, this unlimited model. Um, automatic deposits, uh, regular reporting, and of course, being extremely transparent on, on our financials and really making it clear that ACM isn't using this model to grow its surpluses and grow its profitability, but we're using the model to, to, to really create a sustainable open access future. Next slide, Howard. So um, another I'm aspect- about to wrap up. I'm about to wrap up, okay. So um, some of the infrastructure, let me just kind of go through a very quick list of the key infrastructure pieces for us um, that, that we had as, as a major challenge. Publication data, financial data, developing in-house reporting systems because those reporting systems don't exist outside the organization, doing institutional repository deposits um, and setting up the infrastructure for those. Usage statistics, of course, this is something that's been you know, in the works for many years and counter deals with that, but um, really being clear about what content is open access and what's not open access is a challenge. Invoicing systems, developing these in-house, having systems that are available outside that you can work with. Um, completely re rejiggering or reworking uh, your production workflows um, and, uh, and, and sort of being more, let's say more aggressive about using uh, institutional identifiers, uh, using author identifiers like ORCIDs, mandating those identifiers uh, and using the institutional identifiers like the ROR database um, are all gonna play a major role. Um, I will say that the business models tend to be uh, simple by comparison. The infrastructure issues are significant. And even two years in for ACM, developing a lot of this work in-house, um, it's, it's still a significant effort. So with that, I'll hand it back to David and uh, happy to answer any questions uh, through, the, through the Q and A as we go. Okay. Um, thanks. thanks, Scott. Um, um, yeah, if you can just check on the Q and A, then I, I had one quick question. When you're talking about identifying authors, you're focusing on the corresponding author, not all authors of the paper. Yeah, I mean, we we certainly look at both uh, categories. So on the one hand, um, the model itself and the tiering is based on just uh, corresponding articles, corresponding authors that are are, are affiliated with those institutions. Um, we also look at all affiliated authors and we have that data as well um, because we, we do provide as part of the model um, automatic deposits of accepted manuscripts for all of the co-authored articles that are not corresponding for an institution. So if, if an MIT, which is a participant in, in, in the pilot, uh, has um, you know, lots of co-authors of a work where the corresponding author is not from MIT, um, that we certainly will send them a version of the work to put into their IR. Okay. Thanks, Scott, because I think that's going to differ from what we're going to hear from, from Sarah, where, where uh, they're looking more broadly across all the authors of the paper. So it sounds like you collect that data, but the model's really uh, focused on uh, right now the corresponding author, which is probably complicated enough already. Um, so let's, let's turn things over to, uh, to Sarah. 
uh, from the Public Library of Science, who's going to talk about their community action publishing model. Hi, everyone. Thanks so much for the time. Um, next slide, please. I'm going to dive right in. Um, a lot of times we get asked this question before diving into the models themselves. So I'd like to provide a really quick, uh, just a high level overview. Um, PLOS knows it's very much implicated in the development of a business model via APCs that excludes uh, folks via creating a barrier to publishing. So we want to be part of the solution that is uh, experimenting with models that move away from APCs or integrate APCs in other ways. Um, we obviously need to have a competitive offering to many of the other publishers out there that are engaging in these models, making it essentially free for their authors. Um, if PLOS wants to stick around, we need to remain competitive in that space. And we want to demonstrate that these models work uh, and that other um, institutions, hopefully other publishers would consider uh, experimenting them much with the success that uh, Richard and annual reviews have had with other people taking up subscribe to open. The whim chimes are from me, guys. Sorry, that's coming from my, uh, I'm sitting outside. So if that's super annoying, I will uh, go back inside. Just let me know. Uh, next slide, please. So um, the flat fee models that we've developed, there's actually two. I'll focus on community action publishing today, but we actually have two separate models that work very much like what Scott um, shared, uh, are really predicated on uh, spending about nine months talking to libraries across the globe about their needs, uh, having been multiple years in now to, um, using flat fees as, excuse me, using APCs as the primary mechanism for handling um, OA. So the next slide kind of walks through the feedback that we got um, for both models. So on the left hand of the screen, we have what we call a very sexy name, flat fees, uh, that relates to unlimited publishing in our mega journal plus one and our community journals. So you pay one time annually, the same amount each year, you get unlimited publishing in those titles. Community action publishing Publishing pulls out our two highly selective journals, PLOS Medicine and PLOS Biology, because we were trying to solve slightly different problems with that experimental pilot, um, and we have different mechanisms around it. So first, I just want to talk about the rationale, and then I'll dive into how they work. So if you can um, just follow me through, each one of these is going to... Um, uh, animate separately. So the ba the main feedback we got around flat fees was the APC admin um, went from being a nice idea to the kind of thing where you have teams in the UK and Northern Europe of five, six, seven people whose pure focus is managing APCs, figuring out who paid, who didn't, what grant money was used, checking reporting, hundreds of publishers, thousands of papers. Um, it's a nightmare. It's a big part of why OA Switchboard um, uh, came into, into being. Uh, this feedback was pretty much consistent. Uh, thankfully, funders are increasingly willing to support other models, but we're going to come back to this. As long as funders are largely wedded to APCs as the mechanism by which they support OA, we're going to have a problem shifting from models that don't use APCs that are more like flat fees. So I'll come back to that. Thankfully, funders are starting to consider it. And then there are issues with deals that have publishing caps. Um, we've heard, we're hearing a little bit about um, the Wiley JISC deal, certainly um, agreements we've seen in Germany have had these issues. Nobody wants to run out of those free publications. So having models that are predicated um, on a ballpark uh, publishing volume above which you exceed uh, capping out is a problem. And so we, we took that into account. On the community action publishing side for PLOS Medicine and Biology, uh, you can click through, David, thank you. The goal with this model was a different question. So our issue here was we have journals that are expensive to produce because they're highly selective. We know from our communities that those journals are valued. How do we make them open access without falling into the, well, if you want them open, you're gonna pay $6,000. Uh, we decided that the argument of high APCs for highly selective journals is the only way we wanted to disprove that. And so the goal was, can we make highly selective OA um, APC free uh, whilst also covering cost? Because those two journals have been subsidized by PLOS One uh, to keep their APCs low. So basically what we did is we make publicly available the total cost and margin that we're trying to cover for both of those two journals. Uh, it's public on our site. We uh, worked with libraries like MIT and many others to come up with an equitable distributed tiering system that takes that cost, distributes it amongst institutions. Institutions pay an annual flat fee for unlimited publishing in those two titles. One of the, the two big innovations with this model um, relates to the author 
um, attribution, uh, which David flagged. So this is the first model that I'm aware of that not only looks at the affiliation of the lead author, but also the affiliation of the contributing authors. And we think this is really important because contributing authors are bringing as much to a paper as the lead author. So in the shift to, to move away from, you know, legacy forms of research assessment, we think we do need to be looking at what contributing authors do, but they also have a benefit as a publishing, as, as part of a publishing group. And there, there's also a cost uh, that comes for contributing authors and institutions need to start thinking about what it means to take on that cost. So this model looks at the publishing activity as reflected by affiliation of both lead and contributing authors. If you are a member of the community when your authors publish, uh, they have no fees. If your institution chooses not to become a member, that's totally fine. Your authors are subjected to non-member fees that we are raising aggressively year over year to eventually just be the cost each paper um, would cost to, to publish. Any revenue above that total target that we're making publicly um, available would be redistributed back to members in the form of discount. So much like the ACM model, cap is capped. The margin is capped. The number of articles in those journals are going to be capped. And the goal is to cover the cost prudently and, and redistribute funds back. Uh, next slide, please. So um, you can click through on all of these. This is basically the, the bare bones. Um, unlimited publishing for a fee. Uh, on the left, the flat fees are really just focusing on a tiered mechanism um, by which you, you pay one fee and you publish as much as you want. The, uh, the journals on the, the community action publishing journals uh, have a little bit more uh, nuance there, but essentially from the library perspective, again, it's one fee for unlimited publishing. Next slide. Um, it's important to stress this, I think, as the as the native OA publisher on the on the panel, that these are not licensing agreements. There is no read component in these. PLOS is open access CCBY. Um, and so some of the things, for example, that Scott mentioned that are included on in all their agreements, PLOS doesn't do. Um, we don't uh, do deposition into institutional repositories. Um, there's a number of, of things you would have looked for in a long licensing agreement that you won't see because our content is natively open. I'm happy to dive into that detail in discussion, but I just want to reiterate the obvious that these aren't license agreements and some of that licensing brain kind of needs to go away when thinking about um, native OA publishers. Next slide, please. Um, so infrastructure and challenges. Yeah, I'll dive into those. Um, the next slide, I'll kind of go through what, uh, what I think I actually, yeah, David, just go ahead and advance. Sorry, I can't remember what, what was on this. There we go, right. So um, for PLOS specifically, it's funny to hear the challenges um, and I, Scott shared these many times that they've faced because ours are kind of the reverse going in the opposite direction, right? So PLOS is optimized from for retail, you know, small dollar amounts, high volume, authors as the primary customer. Now we have to shift to larger, a mixed model where we have larger agreements B2B with libraries and we need to have the ability to support um, the way libraries expect to do business whilst also having that retail business going on simultaneously. So there's a very big infrastructure lift that comes with a lot of cost um, that lifting the hood and explaining to libraries has been a really interesting process, whether it's been the negotiation with CDL or MIT or others. Data quality is critical to this, like Scott said. Um, the biggest lift for the CAP model was the hundreds of hours of data cleanup to get institutional affiliations for co-authors and lead authors. Um, a huge lift and a huge tension between the commercial part of the business that's thinking about these kinds of things and the editorial part of the business that just wants to make the submission process as smooth as possible. Do we want to force authors to uh, share grant IDs and um, uh, fund ref stuff? Do we want to force authors to tell us how are you paying, who is funding it? There's a tension there um, that, that we haven't solved uh, that makes making this data as clean as possible more difficult. Uh, certainly shared standards are a huge issue. Um, our agreements uh, are very short. There's no read component to our agreements. Um, there's a case to be made that if our model works, our contracts work, perhaps another native OA publisher might use the same um, contract uh, or, or definitions even, um, or reporting standards such that what libraries experience is the same and we can develop a bit of scale um, from some of that efficiency. 
and then a big thing for PLOS, which um, may seem kind of counterintuitive, but is a huge one, is really before I came to PLOS, there were very few folks uh, there who had a lot of um, engagement with libraries. So understanding the priorities, what the things that are top of mind, you know, when Courtney comes to me with a set of questions uh, from the MIT libraries, we need more people within PLOS to understand what those questions are about, what's driving them. Um, and so that's a, that's a growth process we're in the process of right now. Last slide. So the questions I like to, to pose to the various stakeholders um, in the room uh, today are uh, fourfold. So for funders, the big question I have to you is how are you, how are you going to support how authors pay fees? If the in insistence is we are going to embed APC funds within grant funds, there isn't enough money in the system. Um, until libraries can somehow unlock the money that authors are getting from grants. You have this problem where that money is locked away and the library is trying to find new money in the case of PLOS, they've never paid for us before in the past, new money to support publishing. Um, models like California's, Speak, start to speak to this. PLOS has an iteration of our flat fee model, which tries to speak to maintaining the grant funding from authors. But ultimately, it'd be really interesting to see funders consider other ways of, of injecting fees in that don't lock us into author by author by author. Consortia, just flagging that um, the scaling issues that consortia have mean that small publishers can really be left out in the dust. Um, we, we, it makes total sense that a consortia doesn't have time to talk to one tiny society publisher about two journals that each cost $500, but we really have to think about what the impacts are for the publishing ecosystem if those tiny, tiny um, organizations can't get a foot in the door with the big consortia that can make these deals scale. Um, libraries just... Uh, always reminding that these are not um, licensing agreements. And so what shifts need to be made on the library side to accommodate the new workflows and new ways of thinking about models that you haven't had to before when you've been thinking about licensing. Um, and then researchers, you know, how much, how much information are you willing to provide? If we're not willing to push researchers on using persistent identifiers, uh, telling us how they're paying from what source of funding, the data is never going to be clean enough to make this scalable. And I, I think probably every publisher would agree, short of the infrastructure that has to be changed internally to make this business possible, the data cleanup, the data lift, the data hygiene um, makes or breaks all of these models. And um, we need to help each other out, but we also need the, the authors to do their part there. And I think I'm at time, so I'll stop there. All right, thanks, Sarah. Um, there are a couple of questions for you in the Q&A. Um, my quick comment is just um, really interesting, the idea of the grant funds being locked away from the libraries and thinking about how you might, you know, I mean, many funders are willing to um, say, oh, well, you know, here's money in your grant to pay an APC or to pay for publishing. Um, and just thinking in terms of so much of a grant is going to also include overhead, you know, are there ways to shift publishing expenses away from here are the funds that go directly to the researcher or the laboratory to this is now a chunk that goes into overhead that goes to your institution for for you know managing on that level um is that, I, should add, I should add david some some um funders welcome comes to mind um ukri are starting to think about those shifts and and are engaging with our model to make that possible but if they hadn't been for example that JISC agreement never would have been possible so you know just calling out the ones who are starting to think about it yeah i think it's you know it's interesting in things of you know if, it, if it's just coming out of the same pool of overhead the institutions are not going to be happy but if it's money coming away from the researchers to go into overhead then the researchers aren't going to be happy so somebody's going to have to uh, to compromise somewhere in there um but thanks take a look at the q a and um uh, we're going to move on to to our next speaker now, uh, uh, Richard. If you're ready, you'll tell us about uh, subscribe to open and how you're doing things at annual reviews. All right, thanks very much, David, and hello everyone. Um, I am going to discuss subscribe to open, and I'll use annual reviews application of it uh, where an example is needed. But there is an active community of practice around subscribe to open, and just to say that we welcome the enthusiastic. Uh, the sceptical or just the plain curious to check out the website and also to attend our monthly meetings if you're interested. Uh, next please Howard. So subscribe to open is conceptually very simple. 
we ask that subscribing customers continue to subscribe and if they do so in sufficient numbers, which in the case of annual reviews is essentially all of them because of our tight margins, then new volumes are published open access with no additional fees of any kind. If subscriptions are insufficient, then the paywall is retained and access is restricted to subscribing customers. Uh, next, here are some of the features of subscribe to open. First, it's a straightforward way to achieve diamond open access. As I said, there are no hidden costs. It uses existing budgets, existing relationships, and existing infrastructure. Uh, you might think of it as an evolutionary approach to open access. Uh, that said, in its impact, Subscribe to Open is genuinely transformative. It applies immediately to all authors in all institutions across all disciplines. So we believe that S2O or Subscribe to Open sets out a collaborative, rapid, transparent, and equitable move to open access. Next, uh, here's where things stand with uh, Subscribe to, to Open implementation. Uh, this is from the community of practice. In 2021, there are currently eight publishers using Subscribe to Open to publish 74 journals. Uh, we are the only review only publisher in that list. The others are publishing um, primary journals uh, for the most part. Uh, next, uh, this is just an example of the impact that Subscribe to Hope Open has had on one of our uh, titles, the Annual Review of Public Health. It flipped to open using Subscribe to Open in March of 2020. And in March of 2021, article downloads are five times higher than when it was behind the paywall. That's a social science journal and all of the content is open. Next, the big question uh, for us and for everyone around Subscribe to Open is sustainability. And it comes down to this question, why should libraries participate in Subscribe to Open? There surely must be a temptation to cancel subscriptions and hope that others will pay the so-called free rider problem. The simple um, sort of esoteric answer is that if libraries take that choice, the conversion to open access will fail due to lack of support for subscribe to open and total access subscription will be retained. But I think that there are much more positive reasons to subscribe to open. Institutes of learning surely have a responsibility, indeed a privilege, of uh, enriching the wider community. Uh, using Subscribe to Open, for example, the universities of Santiago, of Washington, of Glasgow, of Osaka, can, without spending any additional money, provide every Santiaguina, every Seattleite, every Glaswegian, and every Osakan with access to high quality information. And this isn't just theoretical. These opportunities are being taken by public health departments, by social, pub, social justice organizations, uh, the parents of uh, children on the spectrum, amateur astronomers, and so on. I think it should be a source of deep pride and satisfaction for subscribing institutions that they are providing research knowledge, they are fighting against ignorance and deliberate information, and they are reaching outside of their walls to empower their neighbors. Um, this responsibility that I think that they have should also be accompanied by recognition. And we intend to use geolocation to inform users that their free access to content is in part supported by their local subscribing institution, providing an acknowledgement of that institution within the neighborhood, within the city and within the state. So the goal of open access is to retain a large number of subscribers paying smaller amounts rather than a small number of subscribers paying large amounts. This approach of spreading responsibility and sharing credit, I believe is healthy, fair and empowering. I do applaud the approaches that some publishers and major institutions are taking to achieve open access by centralizing publishing payments 
around a few elite institutions in a handful of countries. Subscribe to Open is a different approach. I think it's a complementary approach. It will help us move away from transactional relationships to a sense of collaboration amongst publishers in a wide range of ins institutions, and hopefully more and more institutions rather than fewer and fewer. As an aside, um, I think that publication is just the beginning of the process of connecting research to wider society. And we publishers and we institutions could together serve as a bridge between the two. And the S2 approach, I think, tees this up. Uh, as, as the other two speakers have said, um, and is true of subscribe to open, um, this demands transparency on the part of the publishers, and we are um, very happy and indeed keen to be transparent about our costs. There are a couple of um, practical um, benefits to subscribing institutions as well, um, and that is, in the case of annual reviews, access to reviews in advance the uh, journals will flip to open access when the full um, volume is published. It'll provide perpetual access to content. And uh, in the case of annual reviews, access to 85 year old archive of content. And next slide, please. The technology and infrastructure needs of subscribe to open, I think reflect, reflect the fact that this is an evolution of the subscription model. One thing that we would like to see is KBART data, uh, metadata reconfigured um, so that knowledge bases, discovery layers, and library catalogs can distinguish among different types of open access mechanisms. I think at the moment, uh, things are labeled either as subscriptions or as open access. And of course, subscribe to open is both a subscription and open access. And we would like to clarify that there may be other uh, models of read and publish and, um, and, and the PLOS model that need clarification as well. Uh, there's a great need to work with uh, counter and subscribing institutions to provide the usage data that will meet the requirements of the customers. Hopefully um, Google CASA, Get FTR and other um, authentication APIs can be involved in this. I think one of the big questions is how the subscription institutions will consider unauthenticated usage, which could come from inside their institution or outside. And I think conversations around this issue are beginning to take place. Um, as I say, I'm also very keen to work on the delivery of acknowledgements to unauthenticated users using geolocation uh, specific messaging. Uh, next slide, please, Howard. So looking ahead, um, our main task, I think, is to work collaboratively with libraries. And I will emphasize that the libraries are the ones that are going to make the decision on whether this is going to work or not. We're, we're in their hands. Um, I, I think we want to work on a shared mission to make scientific insights available, not just to researchers, but to these policymakers, business leaders, educators, and citizens that are grappling with many issues today. I hope that we'll be able to attract more partners in this task as uh, sub sub Subscribe to Open um, progresses. Funding agencies are already beginning to look at Subscribe to Open, um, and it looks as though they're going to agree to um, contribute at some level. In fact, the Wellcome Trust have already said that they will, and I think the DFG in Germany as well, by reimbursing institutions that um, participate in subscribe to open programs. Um, there's a big question around launching new products. Uh, there are a couple of approaches to that that I wouldn't go into just now, but there is a way of collecting together a group of supporting institutions and launching um, new titles um, under a subscribe to open model. Uh, the need for financial transpar transparency, as I've said, is fully acknowledged, it's, it's crucial. Uh, lastly, you may have uh, noticed that um, all of the participants in the Subscribe to Open Community of Practice, and indeed the three of us speaking here today, are smaller uh, society publishers, nonprofit publishers, and small commercial publishers. The independence and financial health of this group of publishers, I think, is important to the future of knowledge dissemination. Uh, it's very 
agreeable that all of us are sharing our experiences and experiments and, and we talk frequently amongst ourselves. These are not competitive approaches. I think they reflect the opportunities and challenges faced by different types of publishers. And I sincerely hope that we all succeed. And I think I have one more slide, but I'm, oh yeah, it's just a quote that I like from Oscar Wilde, which is, uh, we're all in the gutter, but some of us are looking at the stars. So thanks very much. Hey, thanks, Richard. It's interesting just thinking about annual reviews as a as a different sort of beast, as a journal that that is commissioning articles rather than just taking you know submissions of of current research over the transom. You're actually curating and putting together these things, and that sort of data lift for you and a lot of the material you need to supply. I mean, is 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 different in that you're really focused on usage almost more so than than authorship, which the others are. Um, although I'd like to also be clear that that there are um, journals publishing new research that are employing the subscribe to open model. So that's it's not just the reviews, but um, but it's a different sort of lift there. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm uh, very encouraged that we're the only re review publisher amongst the uh, seven or eight publishers in the community of practice that are using this that's review only. So uh, at least some organizations are are seeing that it's applicable to their primary research journals. Okay, but it's interesting, it's a different, you know, you're, there is a usage focus, I guess, to the model of, you know, look how much value this is providing to you because you're reading this so much, it was why you should continue as opposed to, we are supporting your authors who, who need to get their work out to the world. So it's, um, it's a, a different data set. It's interesting. Um, let's move on to Courtney. Uh, Courtney Crummett from the MIT Libraries. Um, we'll move things over to you. Hey, great. Hi, everyone. So you can go next slide. So um, I'm Courtney Crummett, and I'm the collection strategist for science and engineering and research data at MIT Libraries. And I'm also on the MIT Libraries negotiations team. So to complement what these publishers have shared so far, I'm going to speak about what libraries need from publishers before and after these new OA models are put in place. Next slide. MIT libraries negotiations take a team-based approach, uh, focusing on principles rather than positions using the MIT framework for publisher contracts. This framework was written and released in October of 2019 uh, by the faculty committee of the library system, and it's been endorsed by over 200 organizations, groups, and libraries. The publisher framework is a mechanism for ensuring that scholarly research is open to all and that authors retain the rights that they can share as they see fit. The framework represents principles and values that align with the mission and vision of MIT. MIT Libraries has open access agreements with all three publishers that have spoken today's panel so far. And these agreements align with many aspects of the framework. So after the OA agreements are finalized through the negotiations team, we have an OA workflow team that works directly with uh, the publishers and the MIT authors to enact the agreement for our community. So my perspective today on what libraries need before and after these new OA models are put in place is from my experience on the negotiations team and working with colleagues that support the open access workflows for authors. Next slide. So before new open access models are put in place, libraries and publishers, libraries need publishers to be willing to experiment and to be flexible. So not every library can fit into a cookie cutter OA model. While the publisher has a really clear idea of what their model is, the libraries are coming from uh, varying budgets, they have varying author publication behaviors, and they have varying open access goals. So it's important for a publisher to really think about the library that they're working with and the specific needs of that particular library. And, and libraries can do the same. MIT Libraries has our own very specific open access goals. And in some cases, the publishers just aren't there yet, but we're willing to experiment while we both work together to get there. For example, we need cost transparency 
And um, some publishers aren't ready to do that prior to the Plan S transparency framework deadline of 2022. Maybe a publisher would be willing to share the draft of the work as they meet that deadline. Maybe a publisher isn't sure about auto deposit. Um, we think that an auto deposit pilot experiment is a great way to examine how green OA impacts subscription revenue. If publishers don't have an open access model that suits that library at that time, maybe there's a way to take a chunk of subscription money and transfer it to open access initiatives within the publisher's organization. So there's no, you know, one size fits all OA model and, you know, experimentation and flexibility is needed, but the bonus is that these collaborations build partnerships. Next slide. As I mentioned, we need publishers to provide transparency in the price of the OA model. With the Plan S transparency framework deadline on the horizon, that may be easy for publishers soon, but for now we have found that it's a tough conversation and it you know, leads to us asking a lot of questions and having a lot of meetings, looking underneath the hood of a publisher's financial organization. And it often feels like we're asking for a utility bill, but this aspect is really crucial to MIT libraries. And we're, we're willing to pay for the services provided by publishers but we need to understand how the fees are determined and what the services are costing us. Next slide. We also need information about, about a publisher's commitment to equity. You know, OA models create a divide between authors who can pay to publish and authors who can't because they're not well-funded or affiliated uh, with well-funded institutions. And so MIT Libraries wants to see publishers participating in initiatives that seek to eliminate that divide and create a scholarly communication landscape that isn't based on the ability to pay for open access per se. And an OA APC waiver program for authors is a great way to participate in equity, but we need information about the waiver program. So for instance, how many authors have they assisted uh, how many APC dollars have been contributed? How many papers are now open access that wouldn't otherwise be open? Um, we also are interested in the author's experience with the waiver program. Uh, what are the what is the publisher doing to reduce the participation barriers? Is it easy for the author to find out about the waiver program? But participation in equity doesn't have to just be about a waiver program. Maybe there's a cultural change in the organization that contributes to supporting scholarly communication equity. Has the publisher signed on to DORA? Have editorial policies changed in order to help minimize the career impacts that women in STEM will be facing due to impacts of coping with the pandemic? We want to hear about all of these activities, and um, we're, we're interested in creative ideas um, that, that are happening in that space. Next slide. Before new models are put in place, we also need publishers to provide accurate author publication data. So we've heard all three publishers talking about this. This is not uh, new information, um, but it's important for the libraries to see the data um, that's behind this because the publication data is um, what the fee for the open access model is based on usually. So it's really important for the publisher to share the data with us so that we can review it. Um, this has been a really important process for MIT because we're in such a research dense area and we have researchers that have multiple affiliations, um, multiple organizations and schools and you know, those affiliations, if they're misrepresented or misunderstood, um, it could impact our fees. So the ability to review like the corresponding or contributing um, author data is really important to us. Next slide. 
Many of these new models have workflows that impact library services and staff. And so it's really important that we get a clear explanation and agreement about what is expected of the libraries, particularly staff or infrastructure buildup um, before the model is put in place so that we can set that, that staff time aside and we can prep those, um, those people. So does the publisher need a lot of help developing the author workflow or is it already set? If there's auto deposit included, uh, do we need to connect the two technical teams uh, to identify any obstacles? So next I'm gonna move on to what we need from publishers after the OA model is put in place. So after new open access models are put in place, Libraries need publishers to make clarity a priority when developing author workflows. Workflows with really concise and clear instructions, fewer steps and clicks, and fewer emails are best. And that's directly from our authors. We also need to see the workflow firsthand so that we know what the authors will experience. Allowing library staff a direct view into the author workflow, either through a screenshot or access to the system, enables us to better support the author and may impact the success of the model. We, we can then anticipate questions and build up our author-facing support, like FAQs. Next slide. We also need to have the license terms be the default option in the author workflow. If we agree to OA by CC BY, we want that to be the default license choice the author sees in the author workflow, in addition to an option to choose something else. Next slide. And while we're given this direct view of the author workflow, we need the ability to suggest changes to the publisher. We know our community well and can identify places in the workflow that can cause confusion. The same can be said for any public facing information the author may read about their institution's OA publishing options on the publisher website. Next slide. And lastly, ongoing communication from the publisher about the use of the OA model is really important to libraries. Receiving reports or getting access to a dashboard which shows st uh, statistics and general transparency, it lets us know that the OA agreement is working and that authors are able to navigate the author workflow and then eventually publish OA, which is the goal of the agreement. So this information is also helpful to determine papers, to identify papers um, to deposit for our local copy. Next slide. So there's the before and after, and it may take a lot of work and a lot of meetings and a lot of sometimes tough lines of questioning and um, lots, of, uh, lots of work, but these new models, I, I think, are successful and better for it when libraries and publishers work to understand each other's needs and um, provide clarity and perspective to each other. So thanks. All right, thank you. Um, Howard, how much time do we have here? I just wanna get a sense of. Uh, until 12.15. Okay, so holler at me when we start to run out. Um, so Courtney, I, I, you know, one of the words you used that I think everybody used was uh, transparency. Um, that was, you know, something something common across all of that. And, you know, our panel today was, you know, a set of not-for-profit uh, publishers. Um, and, and transparency may mean, and financial transparency may mean something very different to a nonprofit 501c3 um, organization than to a commercial uh, organization with, um, you know, with shareholders and, and some uh, proprietary information. Um, what I wanted to think about is, is, you know, you can ask, all right, tell me, tell me about your finances, but I'm trying to think about doing that at scale. Um, and one of the issues I've had, I think, with the, um, you know, the plan S transparency thing is that it's, it's sort of 
well, you know, give us a list of, of your finances and there's no um, organized standard set of standards and formats for that reporting. So I wanted maybe starting with you, Courtney and, and, and um, you know, Richard and, and Sarah, I think Scott has had to leave now, um, jump in to what do you, you know, are there possibilities for um, standardized financial reporting that would sort of fit the bill here? Yeah, I mean, I think that's a great question. I, I We're not married to the Plan S trans, transparency framework format, right? So we love, you know, we love that it's going to encourage a lot of transparency. And it, you know, my point in saying that directly reflects the spirit of experimentation. So um, we have talked to many publishers about, okay, forget about Plan S transparency. Like, can you share with us these particular things? And so we're just doing it like we're whatever conversation and how it's going and what they're willing to share and trying to continue to push for transparency in a way that both gets us what we want, but is is comfortable for the publisher because we are trying to make a you know a partnership that's long lasting, um, and it is it's a new question that you know specifically commercial publishers you know are are facing like no one wants to look underneath the hood, or no one wants to admit a very high profit margin. Um, so it is, it's a, it's a careful conversation and uh, we just continue to talk about experimentation and the need of transparency to get through that. Okay. So maybe, maybe it's too early days in terms of scaling this up and saying, here's this, you know, fill out this form sort of piece. You, you know, we're still working out what's, what's acceptable to both sides of the equation here. Yeah. I don't think we're there yet. If I, if I, if I get there, I'll let you know. <laughs> um, yeah. But it's helpful. I mean, I, I, you know, I think it's really helpful that, that, you know, PLOS and annual reviews and ACM have been so public. Uh, and so, you know, it's not transparency just to the customers. It's, you know, there's a transparency to everyone. So everyone can see these examples. Yeah. And yeah. And learn from them. Um, I want to turn to the data lift, which was also, you know, the metadata and, and in particular, you know, authorship information and usage um, information, which I both think are, 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 are we need, we need better <laughs> for, for, for sort of both of these things. Um, I'm curious to hear, um, you know, from the library and, and maybe from Plus also um, the, this question of sort of usage um, in, a, in an open access sort of, you know, if you're signed on to the CAP model, do you still keep track of usage on your campus of the journals or is, is you know, authorship while you're thinking about? It? And then from, Pl from Sarah, um, when Plus reports back, I know you're reporting your institution published X number of articles. Here's the list of articles. Do you also give usage information back to say MIT of here's how many times articles that you paid for to be openly published were, were read? Yeah, happy to dive into that. So um, we do, we do both. Um, the usage question is really interesting to us and it's it's another can of worms that, you know, maybe we don't want to go down this, this particular panel, but um, obviously the historic paradigm of usage tracking through um, counter metrics is all predicated on a subscription paradigm, right? So even the, the recent counter five changes that allow you to look at OA status, if everything you publish is OA, you publish is OA, 99% of the counter reports become moot because of the whole point of firewall versus not firewall. So we're actually partnering with counter um, and Liblinks on next gen OA stats that we hope tell a much more comprehensive story about usage from the perspective of this is the stuff we pay to publish. How is it being used? Rather than these are how many people within, you know, MIT's authenticated IP engaged with our stuff, because obviously access via authenticated IPs is a fraction of the access that we see for natively OA content. So the, the short answer is we are providing the usage data. Right now it is just the counter data, but we are working on um, prototype reports that we're getting feedback from all of our customers on this year about what they want to see in those reports. And those will become monthly things that we, we provide annually. And we hope other publishers uh, consider using the same kinds of reports so we can have something that's standard and we'll work with counter on that. Um, and right now we're not factoring usage into the building of our models in terms of determining fees and stuff. But that to me 
is the next phase and something Courtney and I have spoken about specifically, you know, right now these model models are all predicated on how much publishing happens, but there is a read benefit that um, every institution is getting, whether or not they publish, we think that should be captured in some way and, and a cost associated with it. We haven't figured out how to do it. We're hoping MIT and all of our other partners will help us with that, but that'll be the next phase. And we need to get a couple of years of solid usage data under our belts before we figure out how to do that. And, and how much trouble is it going to be for all of you if, you know, as we move into a more open access world, no one is sort of signed into their institution anymore and, and you won't be able to see, all right, you know, you know, this number of MIT users read the, you know, the journal, it's just going to be kind of a blur. Yeah, I mean, it's an interesting question. I mean, we are, you know, right now in the first year, I think of, or the beginnings of many of these new models are interested in making sure that our, you know, authors know about them, the model and are enacting the model so that what we paid PLOS for is getting used. But I would say that MIT as a whole has a philosophy of, you know, the greater good, the global researcher. And so while, you know, we are interested in our MIT readers reading the content that, you know, is being published by MIT, but being published by others in PLOS or reading the PLOS journal, we are really, we want, we want it to make sure that all global readers can read. So we are interested in seeing numbers about, you know, look what you did. You spent this much money and now it's all open and your MIT authors didn't have to pay and look at all these people reading it. Um, that is really, really important to our values. And so whoever is going to figure out how to do that, it's going to be, um, we're going to be really thankful. <laughs> and, and I love, you know, Richard mentioned, you know, um, that sort of calling out uh, to an author of a local institution who has who has paid for um, your access. Um, I love that, you know, the, the development officers probably at that institution will love seeing, you know, that of like, hey, you get to read this because of, you know, what's going on at, at you know, this local university, you know, think about supporting them. Um, you know, how hard is that, Richard? I mean, you know, I assume that is that is very, very makes makes the institutions happy to hear. Uh, well, I hope so. And, and that's why I focused on, um, you know, what we want to provide to MIT is usage from the Boston area or the greater Boston area, because I think that those people in the institutions will be interested in seeing that they're impacting the local community. But I can equally show uh, increases of um, a couple of thousand percent of um, annual reviews content in Bangladesh when we when we move to subscribe to open and, and other parts of the world, there's a huge equity component there as well. So I, I mean, I, I think, it, again, a lot of this is going to come down to um, how librarians view the world. They're the ones with the, the power here. And if they decide that there are metrics that they're going to take into account as they make their decisions, that's going to be really that, that's going to be really helpful or not helpful, depending on what side of the fence they fall on. And of course, they may not all view it in the same way. There's um, Rick Anderson's famous um, skeptical provost in the background as well. <laughs> um, another common piece was uh, author affiliations. Um, what, what can we do to make that better? You know, what are, what are the next steps? You know, we know the ROR is out there. I don't know how well developed. I haven't caught up with it recently. Um, what can we do to get better author affiliations into the metadata for papers? Is it just, you know, having a defined vocabulary and making authors actually put that information in specifically? What are, what are the next steps that we can do to, to make real progress? I was having a side conversation, and again, I'm having them now in Twitter in the Q and A chat. So I can't remember where it happened, but someone asked about, um, you know, hesitations that libraries have had about asking authors to provide metadata in institutional repositories, and it's the same thing, right? We we want to leave authors alone, make their workflows as smooth and frictionless as possible, which means we don't want to push for asking for that extra bit of 
of quality metadata. And I think we're, we're starting to see the price of that. Um, certainly at PLOS, uh, I and editorial ops are, are in a, um, uh, a lovingly filled battle right now about, can we please ask these questions? And it's like, well, Sarah, why do we need to ask? You know, what do we want to add more barriers to authors? So one of the things that we are going to start doing um, is not allowing, like simple things, like not allowing authors to override the Ringgold generated list of institutions. They'd have to choose one that there. And then if they want to elaborate in a free text box, more nuanced, they can, but they, but right now we let them override that. So that's going to go away. Um, another thing that I'm trying to figure out, and if any other publishers have figured out how to do this, please uh, uh, hit, hit my DMs. Um, if we don't want to ask authors how they're going to pay for an APC in terms of the funding source at submission, and fair enough, it's the beginning of the process, is there a point in our workflows, perhaps at acceptance, when authors get an invoice where we can say, you know, three quick three questions, how are you paying, if it's a funder, what funder, God forbid we ask what the grant idea is, we probably won't get that. So we're trying to figure out how to pull that information out without being massively disruptive to authors, but it requires authors to yeah. do something. I mean, the ideal situation would just be to pull on that one ORCID ID and have that tied in with institution, you know, some someday. Um, I, but on that note, you know, uh, Lisa Hinchliff has written and it's in the chat and in the, in the questions, a uh, question about surveillance. Um, we are demanding a lot of data and information on both readers and authors here. And, uh, you know, Lisa, I know is a, is a very strong proponent for, uh, for privacy and protecting the rights of authors and, and protecting the rights of, re uh, of readers. Um, she's asking, you know, are, are author, is readers of open access content are going to end up heavily surveilled in, in order to tell librarians who's reading what they fund, which seems contrary to our value of reader privacy. Are readers the product now, uh, to use the phrase, you know, if you aren't paying, you are the yeah, product. Yeah, I, I want to push back on Lisa there. I mean, at least with the work that we're doing, these are all, the, the data is all counter data. It's all being captured the way counter does now. There's no asking author readers to identify in any way, and we use IP registry to identify institutions. I'm, I don't, if you could flag specifically, Lisa, what we're asking readers to share with respect to privacy that is different from the current paradigm now, that would be helpful. I might be missing something there. Yeah, and I would like to just add like what Richard was talking about earlier. It's really important for us to be, to, as libraries to say, yeah, we provided this content for our community, but look at in our, our uh, commitment, our financial commitment to PLOS has provided access to all these other countries that maybe wouldn't have gotten it or, you know, or subscribe to open, for example, or annual reviews. I think another thing that may happen in the future is how open access readership um, and um, the effects of that are going to be uh, related to the tenure track. So I'm looking for, you know, the excitement of when an author is going up for tenure and he writes on his package like this paper is open access and it's been downloaded you know so many hundreds of times in so many different countries um i think that's that's the the carrot of the you know what you might call surveillance that we're thinking of i mean it's just about access and putting a point on that yeah i mean at least from our point of view we're not asking users for any information right. we are using we are hoping to use their geolocation and and maybe their ip address but otherwise any information that we collect we're putting voluntary uh, questionnaires on the articles and in fact i think it's going to be very useful to see what the what non-academic uh, users think of the the content and how they may even help guide um our authors in in serving their needs better um, there's an ongoing conversation in the chat on this if people want to follow that. I want to close today with asking about the researchers and, and we're making things available to them, new things. You know, you can you can now author a paper in uh, a journal without paying, you know, an, an APC directly out of your funds. Uh, you, you now have access to uh, a journal that you may not have had access to before. Um, how are we... Uh, both as publishers and as libraries communicating these new 
uh, services and new uh, abilities to uh, to authors. What's the, you know, I, I was going to say, you know, I, I had 20 years of experience. I know that authors almost never read the instructions to authors of, OK, if you're at an affiliated institution, do the following sorts of things. How do we make it clear and easy for an author to take advantage of these uh, situations and, and um, you know, without having the, to dig deep? I can share what we're doing. Um, we have a comprehensive communications program that we do with authors. Um, one is via libraries. So every new partner we sign gets this comprehensive like welcome packet of various ways of communicating with their own authors and librarians um, that's pre-populated from banner ads to social postings to email copy um, to stuff like that. And then we have a whole dedicated sort of regular drip campaign to authors from those um, uh, institutions to just remind them like, hey, you have access to this. Uh, and we find that authors are engaging with it, whether um, it's to ask questions for clarification, to ask why is it free to publish in this one, but not in this one, which which comes up sometimes depending on the nature of the deal. So we've we, we feel like those communications are working and the feedback we've gotten from all of our partners is that the um, the information we're giving the libraries is is quite good with respect to helping them communicate out. Okay. Um, it looks like we are we're actually a little bit over we're going to cut the break a little bit short but I was enjoying the conversation so I will apologize because I learned a lot from it. Um, so um, I want to thank all, all the speakers. I thought this was a great session and, and, and I, you know, I, I encourage everyone to continue talking to them in the chat and the Q&A. And um, there are some links posted also to go actually look at the details of each of these different models and the financial uh, pieces that have been put up, I think are, can be informative uh, for, for, for everyone. So, um, so thank you all. Um, in this session, we have a fantastic, lineup of sort of people coming from mixed perspectives and places of work. And we're really focusing on the infrastructural elements needed to make open research work. So what was quite interesting in our preliminary discussions was that there was some sense that, you know, open publications and the models, which we heard about in the first session, you know, far from solved, obviously, but underway. And we, we kind of started gravitating to the space of open data that felt like a place where we could all really, really align without a great deal of conflict and look at, you know, how can we really meaningfully accelerate through collaboration or where do our perspectives or what we think has to happen next differ? So I don't really wanna hear myself talk. We're gonna focus on how we make that happen and our panelists quickly are David Sweeney, the Executive Chair of Research England, UKRI, Lynn Camerlin, Professor of Structural Biology, Uppsala University, Curtis Brundy, AUL for Scholarly Communications and Collections at Iowa State University Library, and Catherine Sharples, Senior Director for Open Access at Wiley. So I think we'll go in order. Um, we have no slides in this section other than the one Howard has up. So maybe we can look at our speakers. Um, everyone will just sort of say something in order to kick it off and then we'll have open conversation Q&A with the panelists. Um, David, would you like to begin? Uh, yes, I'm delighted to be here. And can I say it's a privilege to be on a panel with such eminent uh, people. Lynn, I do hang on your every tweet, I've got to say, uh, <laughs> thanks. Uh, and it was also a pleasure to listen to the earlier uh, session. I, I come uh, as, in fact, executive chair of the biggest single funding council in the UK, but my early career involved uh, responsibility for 10 years for university library and in my university then uh, uh, for determining the budget for the library. So I've been in most of the positions. Uh, we're also unique, I think, in the UK in the in our overall organisation, uh, we fund both research projects and in my bit of the organization, we fund the underpinning research that the government commissions the university to do. Uh, so we give a substantial amount of money uh, to universities, which is not targeted at any particular uh, purpose in research, uh, but will typically be used uh, 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 about 10% of it probably for subscription charges. But I'm also responsible in my umbrella organization for the project funding, and I'll talk about that where we do things differently in the UK, 
I, and I think it works uh, for us. Uh, I guess you've heard that from the Brits a bit. Uh, just before that, can I say, I've listened to the previous conversation. Uh, I think where we are now is that we cannot deliver what everyone wants because of the complexities of the system, the different models, which I heard, thought were brilliantly described in the, the previous session. And I think a focus for infrastructure is on deciding what is absolutely necessary and in challenging ourselves about whether in a future world, it's as necessary as it was in the past. And some of that earlier discussion about collecting reader information, I think is very much in that uh, category. I also think uh, we discussed, I think this being a safe space where we wouldn't fight, uh, if I uh, uh, paraphrase, uh, it distresses me that some of the, di uh, the, the discourse is always focused on why things won't work. Uh, whereas, in fact, most of the use cases in open access are things that have worked. Now, there's certainly a question of whether they will continue to work and whether they are sustainable, but starting from position that they won't be, uh, and I think there's some places where that line is taken uh, uh, quite substantially, uh, is, in my view, not a good idea. So working together, trying things out, uh, minimising the infrastructure as far as we can till we test it. Is my, is my line. Uh, very specifically, so as a funder, uh, I noticed that along with every other actor in the system, we claim a lot of authority, but we're not always so keen to take on the responsibility. Uh, so uh, we do mandate. Uh, some people want us to more strongly mandate because they want us to take the responsibility for decisions, which I think uh, actually funders don't have uh, a, a mandate themselves uh, to take. Equally, of course, university libraries would like us to tell them to do things so that they could pass that responsibility on to us sometimes. Now, I don't say that in any bitter sense, just as a recognition that in the end, we will have to share that responsibility and work together uh, to implement procedures. So uh, Bjorn Brems in his if funders just said that the money had to be spent or couldn't be spent. Uh, I know, because it's my job, that I don't really uh, have the power uh, to do that. And we've got to accept the limitations there are on everyone in the system. Uh, what's special about UKRI is that we, we are a strong supporter of uh, open access uh, where a fee is paid and have been since 2014, I think, uh, roughly at very early on following uh, the Finch review, which uh, I was uh, yeah, very much involved in stewarding. Uh, but we don't pay individual P APCs. What we do is pay a block grant to our institutions and then give the institutions uh, the choice of how to use it. That works, for example, for subscribe to open because it validates the model and allows them to choose to use uh, funds on that but it's not a decision that is taken um, uh, over everyone's head. Now, does that mean so the funder is paying a fair amount? And we do not allow uh, APCs to be charged to grants because we give uh, a block grant. Uh, the sizing of the block grant is therefore important. And we set it at the time that we did as an appropriate percentage of our total research budget equivalent to what we think the purchasing charges are on the research budget. I, I'm not sure actually we got that entirely right at the time, and it's certainly not up to date now, which is why we're in the middle of a review uh, to assess it. But it seems to me the principle, first of all, the principle of whether you should hypothecate, given that it's all one big pot, uh, I, but I think it's useful in this case uh, to, uh, to give a grant and to hypothecate it to indicate it's for the use of that. I think sizing it is really important. But I put it to you that it does cut out a whole load of unnecessary infrastructure in uh, managing APCs at funder level, which in my view, uh, don't add value to the system. So uh, that's, I think my introductory comments. Uh, uh, let's cut every bit of slack and let's try different models out and aim for their success while recognizing that indeed uh, they may not fail rather than predicting doom at the start. Uh, let's look to where we can standardize, uh, but where we may have to forgo as much information as we'd like to begin with. And uh, does it make sense to move away uh, from uh, 
such detail on APCs? And uh, should we go to a block grant that allows the choice of different models for university library, libraries and empowers them, but also gives them uh, resources to do it? Thank you. So wise and well said. So thank you, David. That's quite inspiring. And Lynn, I'm sure you have much to add. <laughs> Please start. Thank you so much. So I second David. It's a real pleasure to be here with such a great set of panelists for both panels and so good to see such a large audience as well. And so I, as a researcher working in computational biochemistry, so I'd like to talk about data sets and the infrastructure for open data sharing. So I've been working with open science for a long time from a researcher perspective, but also policy. And uh, as pretty much everyone uh, present here knows, for a very long time, the focus was on open access, even though open access is just one facet of open science. Now, it's really great to see that in recent years, there's been a much larger move also to focusing on open data and making other parts of the research process open. But the problem with that is uh, the issue of appropriate infrastructure to make it feasible. And so one of the things I've seen in discussions with different stakeholders, data means different things in different fields. And the volume of data means different things in different fields. So for example, in some disciplines, data can be Excel sheets or Word documents or fairly easy to store. And there are already wonderful forums, for example, Zenodo, there's Figshare, Dryad, both commercial and funder supported. And so these are not the data sets where infrastructure is a really major issue. But there are other disciplines such as mine, where when we generate data, we're talking about tens to hundreds of terabytes, sometimes even more. And for example, in high energy physics and in other disciplines where data sharing has been the norm for a long time, there's infrastructure, but there isn't infrastructure for all disciplines. And so for giant data sets, the landscape for infrastructure is much more sparse, especially when there hasn't historically been a culture of open sharing outside networks of collaborations. And also there are other infrastructural challenges. It's not just an issue of where and how to store the data, but also how to access it. So transferring terabytes or petabytes of data, you can't just casually upload or download such large data volumes. And so there are a lot of technical issues about how to make this data open. It also means that researchers, uh, if you do and when you do convince them to share, which obviously I advocate for, you have to make really difficult decisions about what to share when managing really large data sets. And you start asking questions, for example, with simulations, do you want to provide enough to just rerun the simulation or do you want to actually present re end results? And so it's a changing landscape where researchers need to be part of the dialogue. Now, there have been moves to fix this, for example, the European Open Science Cloud is one example that there needs to be more focus on these issues. I was part of a Chemistry Europe open science session just two days ago where there was a question about the role of publishers. And also JETS, the Journal of the American Chemical Society asked a question about this on their Twitter feed this morning about what the role of publishers is in data sharing. And so I was thinking about this morning and I was one of the thoughts that came to mind as a provocative suggestion is uh, on the one hand, publishers could individually, for example, provide infrastructure for sharing data associated with manuscripts, but then you get massive fragmentation issues and you really want a reliable data storage location where you can put everything together and link to. So the same way that different funders support things like Chem Archive or BioArchive, what about funders, institutions, and um, also publishers going in on shared infrastructure that's citable with good means to store also large data sets? But this, of course, raises the question of responsibility. So is providing this infrastructure the responsibility of funders, institutions, publishers, national or transnational supercomputing centers? I put a disclaimer that I'm also involved in uh, supercomputer infrastructure, or a combination of all of these. David before me spoke about shared responsibility. And then finally, it's not just an issue of the hardware. So skills training infrastructure is also necessary in order to train researchers in how to properly curate and streamline such huge data sets. Do we need professionally trained staff that manage this infrastructure and to make, we've talked a lot about clean metadata. So even if it's professionally trained staff, researchers need to be trained to not just do huge data dumps that no one else is going to understand. In order to make these data sets usable by others outside the immediate research team, and so I'd really like to see in coming years uh, streamlined open research flows, which includes data sharing at all steps of the research process. And I think addressing these issues is absolutely essential for widening open data research practices. Thank you. Great. I am actually curious if we have time. Um, 
So Lynn, you've talked a lot about you know, terabytes of data and focusing on usability. David, you mentioned you know, block grants for multiple applications of research advancement at the institution level. Do you have a sense of how broadly speaking these are allocated and how many might be oriented towards data usability at this scale? Is this to me or to David? I was, I was kind of curious how this reached back into what David had said about how institutions are using block grants. But Lynn, if you have some insight into that too, I'd be curious. So, and Curtis it, can chime in as well for anyone else. Yeah. So in my case, because in, so I'm based in Sweden, so we don't have a block grant model. One of the things that I'd like to see more centralized infrastructure is also scaling of costs, because when you have large scale infrastructure, because this is the kind of thing that a specialized supercompute facility would uh, be best placed to provide for large data sets. And so you're dealing with multiple aspects. One is the actual hardware and the bandwidth to store and transfer large data sets, but it's also the FTE that's required to actually uh, manage all this infrastructure. And so of course, if you centralize, you can scale costs very efficiently. And for perspective, in terms of when we talk to different potential providers to store to store our data, the kind of costs we're looking at is between 50 to 200 euros per terabyte per year. And you can see, especially if you want to store data for 5, 10, even 20 years and you're accumulating more and more, that really becomes out of control very fast. And so uh, I would say rather than block grants to institutions because of the scaling issue, I really like, for example, the archive type models with ChemArchive, BioArchive, where specific publishers go in and support. So I would be for pooled uh, infrastructure costs to build large scale infrastructure, where also because if the publishers go in, you can have streamlined connecting data to papers, the same way that, for example, with ChemArchive and BioArchive, you can link things back to the published document. So, but of course, uh, as with, uh, so FAIR is really important and uh, citability is really important. So again, Zenodo, for example, allows for DOIs. So there are the pieces together with small scale data sets for things like Zenodo and so on. And so then scaling this up for large data sets, uh, it requires investment and effort, but I think it's very feasible. Wonderful, terrific. Okay, um, Curtis, you are next with a, a third lens. Wonderful. Well, thank you for the invitation to be here today. So Iowa State University is a, a public land grant university. And you know our, our institutional mission is to not only create knowledge, but to share it with, with Iowa and the rest of the world. And so this idea around sharing data sharing publications um, and, and all the rest. I think it, it's in Iowa State's DNA. And I think you're seeing that if you were to look at our university, you're seeing it across the operation. I mean, we've got a lot of work to do, but in the area of sharing research data, I think we're, we're very active there. We've launched an open data repository. In the area of open access, Iowa State's a leader with these new open models and experimenting with them. And and for my part, I've worked, you know, firsthand directly with all three of the, the publishers that were just on in the earlier session. So, so we're extremely committed, we're experimenting, we're collaborating, and I fully agree with, with what David said about we're at a point of, you know, for me, profound optimism with all of this after working in libraries for, you know, 10 plus years where our engagement with publishers and, and to some extent our researchers was extremely limited. You know, we negotiated price and inflation caps and paid bills. And what we're doing now is sitting at the table with publishers, figuring out how we make this open future a reality. So it's quite exciting. So when I think about infrastructure, we're definitely hitting some pain points with um, things like open access workflows around author verification. Um, I think projects, thinking of infrastructure projects like the OA switchboard, that's something that has tremendous promise that we're more a pilot partner on and we want to see things like that that take off. We need to figure out how to make all of this easier to do if libraries are going to be able to scale it. For our part, we have 10 to 12 of these new open access agreements. And I got to tell you, we were working up until earlier this month just to get our 2020 publishing numbers out and reported out across all these different platforms. So lots of room for improvement. And I will just throw out one thing in the area of, of sharing of research data, a question that we're struggling with is how do we get any visibility whatsoever on where these data sets are being deposited? And so I'm actually 
um, on the advisory board for Chorus. And my interest in Chorus is as a kind of mediating platform in order to see things like that. So when we set up a, a Chorus dashboard, um, can we track these data sets in such a way that we can actually see for compliance reasons and just for tracking cultural change at the institution? So um, yeah, lots to talk about here in the area of publications and, and data. Super. Yeah, that's incredibly helpful. Thank you so much. And uh, yeah, interesting. I think, you know, within the chorus frame, we talk a lot. And going back to David's point, it's trying to identify what are the things that everyone needs that will be really impactful to make this work. And it, it is hard to say, like, how do we prioritize the needs of researchers? Another topic, you know, that's of interest to me is how do the authors themselves fit into this, right? It, what's our role relative to kind of how they're experiencing um, things from the ground level, right? So, um, okay, Catherine Sharples from Wiley is our next presenter. Hi, Alex. Um, thanks for the invitation to be part of this panel. I really enjoyed the, the earlier, um, the first part of this session and, and I really enjoyed the comments from um, my fellow panelists in, in this second part. Um, as we've already uh, touched on, open research is, is a broad topic. Um, and as a publisher, Wiley um, comes at that topic um, from a variety of, expect, of, of perspective that, as I know, um, the other panelists do too. Um, open research to, or open access to research articles being our primary perspective, um, but research data is, is super important or access to um, research data is of course also very important. From, from a publisher perspective, the infrastructure to support open access to research articles is, is more advanced than that to support open data. So I'm going to concentrate my um, brief initial comments there, but I, I know that we'll come to some broader discussion of, of data in our, in our um, time together today. So, you know, Wiley have been publishing open access journals for over 10 years, and we've been offering open access in our hybrid journals for much longer. And the most significant progress that we've made towards open access um, in the past few years have been through the transitional agreements that we've entered into in, in consortia um, across Europe and with institutions um, like Curtis's own institution at Iowa State. And those are partnerships that we've entered into that are designed, as we heard in the first session, to enable increasing numbers of researchers in those institutions and across those countries to make their research articles openly available without the need to find funds for article publication charges. And as a result of those agreements, we've been very invested in ensuring that the infrastructure that we put in place to support open access makes publishing as easy as possible, both from an author perspective and the management of those agreements as easy as possible from an institutional perspective. And um, the panelists in the earlier session touched on the importance of, of these issues really nicely. From an author perspective, it's all about ensuring that we have a means to support authors in making publishing choices that are aligned with their funders and their institutional expectations. So making them aware when they're covered by a transitional agreement or by a funder account and helping them to ensure that they're publishing their work under, for example, the appropriate Creative Commons license in order to comply with, with any funder mandates in place. It probably sounds like a very obvious thing to say, but our goal is always to make publishing as easy as possible, specifically OA publishing in this case, to see as few authors as possible opt out of open access publishing when they're covered by transitional agreements. And we do still see um, a small percentage of authors choosing not to take up the OA option, even when they're made aware of the fact that they're covered by these agreements. And from a funder and, and a library perspective, that means providing the infrastructure to improve article um, eligibility, um, to track and to manage their funds and accounts. Again, our goal is to make these agreements, to make the agreements that we've entered into as easy to manage from a customer perspective as possible. 
So we've developed our own dashboards for payments and reporting. And, you know, we get really strong feedback on that, but it's always our goal to be as customer centric as possible. So we're excited to, to see initiatives like OA Switchboard and, and OABLE develop with the goal, again, of, of making the infrastructure, of improving the infrastructure and insights into the process. Um, all the panelists, I think, in the first session alluded to the importance of data integ integrity, um, of standard author ID IDs and consistency of institutional ones. And that's really important to making things like transitional agreements work. We found the data lift associated with these agreements um, to be, I think, substantial is probably how I would describe it. So as more agreements come online, as more libraries and more consortia look to provide financial support for the transition to OA, it's really important to share our experiences in forums like this one and to look for common approaches and standard ways um, of doing things with the goal of, of um, best serving the researcher and the library community. So I really um, echo David's earlier point of, you know, working the importance of, of trying things out and, and working together. And I look forward to a good conversation here today. Great. So I'm going to welcome questions into the chat that we can surface to the panelists and discussion free form um, between the panelists. I do have one, uh, you know, I was looking at some, some notes, David, on a few things you'd said. And one of the things that really stood out to me was this focus on the term you use, tractability versus intractability. Um, and that to this question of, you know, where, I mean, how we avoid frustration, increase optimism and focus on areas of work where there is some tractability versus intractability. And I think that's really, I mean, it's a big, big topic, but that's one of the questions for this panel is where, and Curtis, you said you're, you're really experiencing some collaborative successes. So where would you aim this community, you know, to get these sort of, they're not even, quick wins is, is not the right term because it's so complex, very infrastructural, but where can we aim together to achieve some of those feelings of success together and high impact? I mean, I, I, I think where I was going with those, uh, those comments is the predilection that some have for producing what they think is a killer argument against some development based essentially on what I would call an edge case. I, it, it will arise, but very rarely. Now, if we're going to try to develop a system uh, where uh, all exceptions, as it were, are eliminated, there are no edge cases, uh, then I fear we have an intractable problem, one we cannot just solve. And as a mathematician, uh, the way you deal with insoluble problems is you simplify them, you solve the simple problem, and then you try and generalize it. So you accept that there'll be things that won't work. Now, I think that's very difficult for us because we have passionately held views, for example, about equity, and it's not always clear how we can deliver equity. The, the, the current Nature uh, paper talking about, uh, I think, inclusion in uh, OA journals is actually about inclusion on APCs, not on OA. And uh, APCs and OA do not are not a one-to-one -one relationship. So I think we do have to try very hard and simplify and accept that things will not be perfect, even some of the things we'd love to see, and store them up as what we've got to do as we generalize the solution uh, to address it. Uh, I, I think there's a whole load of things around where people just say, it can't happen uh, because this won't work. And in fact, it will happen, it will work, and we'll have to pick up the pieces. I, I, I take, mean, I take the responsibility to pick up the pieces and address the things that are not right, but not, not do anything because there will be pieces. And Alex, if I can add to that, I, I agree, just this concept of e experimentation and iteration is really where we need to be. And, there was a comment I saw recently about um, questioning whether or not early success, you know, of course, early success doesn't guarantee long-term success, but, but darn, isn't that a good place to be with early success? That's better than, than early failure. And to me, that's exciting. And the idea that, 
together we are making decisions and librarians are having knocks on their door and giving options to participate in models that lead to content being open, increasing equity for reading. In many cases, these models increase equity for, for authors as well. To me, that's a great place for us to be and to learn from. And I don't think anybody wants to be to spend our next 20 years like we did the previous 20 years where the data sets were sitting on the hard drives, the publications were sitting behind paywalls. And all of a sudden we have seen just in the last two or three years, I feel like a, a real shift in the landscape that is, that is quite exciting. Now that said, when you have success, it means you need to do things different. And when you need to do things different, that means you need to examine position descriptions, workflows, and all those other things, which is where we're at and infrastructure, of course, to try and simplify it all. Lynn, you make a great comment there. And I sort of asked this question earlier, where does the author researcher sit in all of this? You know, we have sort of this ecosystemic vision of how everything could be, you know, vastly improved globally with greater equity and opening up more opportunities for scientific advancement. Researchers are in a highly pressurized and very focused position trying to do what they are trying to do as part of that ecosystem. So it's quite interesting. I mean, is there this sort of, you know, is it appropriate that we are each taking different lenses or how do we, how do we encourage them to be advocates? Are they able to given, you know, the, the great constraints on their own time and focus? So I think there are two aspects of this. One is our responsibility as researchers, because so this how we disseminate knowledge is part of our mandate as researchers. We need to take responsibility for this. But as you pointed out, Alex, I think one thing that gets missed a lot, again, I've been engaged in open science policy as well, and some several of my researcher colleagues have. But if you're active, for example, on Twitter or similar, you get this impression that researchers are very engaged. Whereas the reality is that my uh, on the ground experience is that most researchers have no clue. They are starting to understand what open access is. Many don't really even know what the they know what preprints are, but the bigger implications of different types of licenses, what preprints mean, what it means to actually have shared your data openly and so on. And part of it is precisely as you pointed, this pressure cooker, because research has become so hyper competitive that everyone is kind of running just to stand still. So people don't have time to then step outside the box. So they're aware of things they're mandated to do. For example, in a funder mandate, if you start getting bombarded with you have to do stuff. And what we want is we want researchers not just to be aware, but the best way to get researchers to comply is to get them to see why this benefits both them and the broader community. And there are both personal and community level benefits to open science. And I think really those of us who are engaged in open science, if we want to see a transition in the field, we have a lot of responsibility because we we're really great to see there are 112 participants here, but we really need to get researchers to be more aware and come out of their silos. Uh, we have to disseminate knowledge, so we can't step back from this discussion. I completely ag agree with that. Lynn, I think if you spend a lot of time on Twitter, you can kind of um, come away with the, or labor under the impression that, that researchers um, understanding of open access and open re open research writ large is far greater um, than it is kind of on the ground. Um, Wiley and other publishers um, spend a lot of time putting on um, workshops in collaboration with um, with librarians and with with institutions around the world to to. Um, raise awareness of um, open access publishing options and to to improve understanding of the importance of sharing research articles and sharing data and quite often what we see in those in those workshops is is a much lower kind of level of understanding from the researcher than than we're kind of led to believe if we're if we spend too much time on on twitter so i think we have a, a, a combined educational effort um, that we need to put more um, put more effort into. So if I could just briefly add to that, um, one thing that I think is nice at Uppsala 
is we have this for incoming master students, we have an uh, introductory course at Trans in Chemistry where they learn about different things that are hot in chemistry. But the nice thing is that they've let me sneak in lectures on research ethics, plagiarism, etc. And they give them a lecture on open science. <laughs> now, I'd rather give them a course on open science than a lecture on open science, but I cover just the basics of why open science is important, how you do it, what to share, what not to share, sensitive data, etc. And I think this, I'd like to see this in more educational programs because we focus very much on subject specific training, but these meta issues are just as important to part of the training and skills training and awareness start, should start fairly early in the training process because these are future researchers, right? Absolutely. Yeah. I, I mean, I just couldn't agree, uh, agree more. I, I mean, I think we should, well, in, in my experience, our libraries are doing a phenomenal job to work with the authors uh, to explain things uh, and to, to try and try and shine light. But I, I, I do think the broader responsibility of us all uh, to help researchers uh, know just a bit more about the challenges that are in the research system and the significant agency they have in addressing those uh, it go, goes beyond libraries. And, and I'm not just talking here about open access, but uh, the problems we have with the whole research uh, system uh, around culture, diversity, inclusion, uh, a, a, indeed even um, misconduct. Uh, I, I just think we've learned over the last uh, 40 years that I've actually been uh, a researcher engaged in, in research, uh, that um, uh, societal attitudes have changed, uh, but the research system is perhaps not quite so quick as it could be in getting to grips with the, the challenges. And given that uh, our responsibility to society is immense and one that's being discharged, I think brilliantly, uh, the, the, there's still quite a long way to go, I think, for it to be a fully two-way activity. David, you mentioned something I thought was rather intriguing earlier, which was that the things we focus on now may not continue to resonate in the same way or be as vital in the future. Do you have any sort of examples of, you know, if we if we follow this trajectory, what might emerge more, what might disappear more? Uh, well, I think it's difficult to predict, but I mean, privacy is just the, the, the simplest one because uh, when I was, when I was at university, actually, we had a set, we have a census every 10 years in, uh, in the UK. And there was one uh, when I was uh, at university and, uh, there was a lot of opposition to uh, the census on privacy grounds. Uh, after that, there was quite a long period where people were not sensitive to that. I still don't think actually in the UK, they're terribly sensitive about the, sen uh, about the census and privacy, but privacy generally is now a very big issue indeed. So I, I, I think that's an example of something where there wasn't a, a continuous path one way, there's, there's cycles. Uh, privacy is simple. I think uh, I, there is an argument that uh, libraries I, become more focused on, uh, bluntly, the publish element of the job because access is handled uh, differently. I want to be careful here because I don't want to make huge assumptions uh, around uh, how, li how, how libraries work with their, um, their uh, clients, customers, however you want to refer to. But uh, one of the things, uh, I felt when I first had responsibility for University Library in 1997, we had a lot of siloed activity in the library, cataloging and, uh, you know, was a different classification. It was, uh, we had specialists, which uh, was great, but I think largely the time for that passed and uh, you could buy in services and libraries changed to being far more uh, uh, researcher focused. Uh, in, at least in what I observed, which I think was a good thing. Uh, at the time, of course, uh, the loss of jobs was a dominating uh, conversation, which certainly never happened in my experience. Libraries prospered because they were offering phenomenal uh, services. So I, I think those are, those are examples. Uh, we all take a self-interested point of view of anything, however hard we try not to. Uh, and uh, I think we can only overcome that by uh, all of us learning more about the interactions there are in our system. Yeah, and I think you know we can make a bit of a conscious effort to check that at the door, noting that it's just a human 
behavior, but it's interesting with the topic of sort of agility and continuous learning and dropping some of the perfectionist tendencies. The other thing that I'm, I'm seeing a lot of is there is an element of really de-siloing as we reinvent how we better serve the community and we must actually re-envision the roles that we're playing and how we work together. I think that seems to be true. So those start to pull out some common principles or threads where we can actually be helping one another. Alex, can I, can I ask Catherine a question? Please do. Yeah, just getting back, you know, something that we have noticed at Iowa State is we have entered into agreements with, you know, a, a range of, of size and shapes of publishers now, you know, nonprofit, commercial, um, small to large now. Is there's the tremendous asymmetry like in the infrastructure itself. So when you're talking to smaller publishers, even mid-sized publishers, it's remarkable to what extent their own infrastructure, their own platforms cannot do the things that they need to do in order to, to roll out the, these open models. And a concern that I, a growing concern that I have is with the bigger players, with the deeper investments that can be made in the in the infrastructure. So, and just as an, an example of this, like doing all of this work on the Wiley platform is quite amazing. I'm talking about author verification, reporting, the rest. You get on some of these smaller publishers platforms, you know, some of it again, like we're getting emailed reports, right, that we have to wait, you know, a long time to even get. So the promise of like the always switchboard is that it could, you know, kind of level the playing field. And I think it's very important that we maintain publisher diversity as we go through this transition. So I'd be interested in your perspective on, you know, how do we kind of lift all of the boats by supporting these community infrastructure projects and ensuring that it's, it's kind of, an equitable playing field, even though we are moving toward, I realize in some way, shape or form an, an article economy that bigger players might be set up to dominate. But I don't think that, I, my premise is that's not healthy for any of us. And you're, you're, you're right, Curtis, it's, it's, it's important for the health of our um, ecosystem to, to support a variety of, of players and a variety of models and a variety of, I guess, sizes of, of entities. Um, as, a, as a mixed model publisher, you know, we, we've had to put in a huge amount of, of elbow grease and a huge amount of financial investment to make our infrastructure fit for purpose in an, in an open access environment, in an, in an for an article based economy, but we absolutely recognize that for some of our partners, um, the, the, you know, there's going to come a point where they don't really want to, to work with uh, the Wiley open access dashboard and uh, um, the Springer iteration of that or the um, ACS iteration of that or and whoever else and, and, and have a completely separate interface for PLOS and um, and other publishers. So, so um, entities like the OA switchboard and, and other similar um, functions, I think are important for, for the big players to support. And, and you know, we've had lots of really productive conversations with, um, with Yvonne at the OA switchboard and, and, and have provided you know, some, early, um, some early support to that particular initiative and will continue you know see ourselves continuing to do so um, in future probably not just with OA switchboard but with other entities too because as I mentioned earlier it's our goal as publishers and I think it should be the goal for all publishers to kind of meet their community meet their customer where they are rather than trying to force them down one particular workflow or one particular um, road because it's it's the one that you have the most investment in. Do we have, you know, again, kind of thinking about simplicity. I mean, it's interesting. We want simplicity. We don't want to reduplicate efforts in a million different directions. At the same time, I think we want, you know, new sort of startup initiatives and new things coming into the system all the time. Um, you know, just trying to think about whether we have a common visualization or understanding of everything that's happening out there, right? How do we balance those two things of enabling innovation, but not being too splintered? 
I mean, I think the OA switchboard is a good test case. I remember going along to the very first introductory meeting and I, I haven't had anything significant to do with it. So it just, I, and I thought at the time, it was a wonderful idea that would be too complicated to deliver. Uh, now they've demonstrated that was not true. I, I'm, I think there could be a little bit of work to, to identify what the success factors were. And I mean, I think actually, it's only success so far, uh, but it's nevertheless uh, quite a significant uh, piece of work. Uh, it, is, uh, it has got a very strong cross-community uh, engagement, but I'm not, I, I just not close enough to know why it, it has worked, whereas other things uh, haven't worked. I, I do think um, I, wearing uh, my occasional Coalition S hat, I think Coalition S is, should not be about designing the details of infrastructure. I, I think it's about providing uh, impetus for multiple routes to open access. But we have done some uh, stuff where I'm slipping into Coalition S territory, I should be clear. Uh, and uh, so I think with the, uh, the cost transparency, uh, clearly lots and lots of people want, want it, but addressing what people collectively want. And of course, also what the publishers are able, uh, I think I've got to say, and willing uh, to do uh, uh, with uh, all sorts of comments about competition law thrown in uh, is, is difficult. Uh, this is an area where, which I think needs taken forward uh, and uh, the coalition's work is stimulating that, but should not be the definitive ownership eventually. Really useful to hear. Um, so we are drawing close to our close time, but I want to, any burning questions, please put in queue and they or chat or any sort of summarizing thoughts or takeaways where you, how you'd like us to focus our attention before we dispense. Yes, Alex, I have a quick question for, for Lynn, who, you know, talked very eloquently in her introduction about, about open data and, and data sharing and also reference this recent conversation about the role that publishers should or shouldn't have in um, enabling data sharing. And I just wondered what, what Lynn's perspective on, on the publisher role in that space was. So the one apology is, as you see, I have an active baby now in this Sorry. series. But uh, so I can give a personal story. So coming from a computational background, Historically, one of the biggest uh, criticisms of my discipline has been that we don't give enough data for reproducibility. And of course, this uh, then experimentalists complain that it's a lot because they say we can get in a number we want. And especially the ACS Journal of Organic Chemistry, because uh, organic chemistry is a particular discipline where experimentalists have been skeptical of theoreticians. In the mid 2000s, they started putting a very, very high bar, not just for experimental compound characterization and so on, but also for computational work in terms of the data you have to provide. Now, without infrastructure, this has led to sort of 100, 200 page supporting information documents. You really need a better way to manage it. But uh, basically, this push from publishers and journals to push for data sharing really improve transparency and the reproducibility and computational chemistry and the landscape is very different now and so i mean we've talked about hyper competition and publish or perish so uh, one way to mobilize researchers we want to publish and there are certain journals we want to publish in and if we're mandated to share data to publish in those journals it's the fastest way to get us to do it so as long as the infrastructure is also provided i think publishers play a really central role in providing the carrots to get researchers to mm. share data Good. I, I do appreciate that question because, you know, as part of this, you know, how do we collaborate? One of the key questions is, you know, I, I do like this idea of where can we really seamlessly band together and um, sort of unify towards shared causes for sure. Um, okay, others, before we wrap up, final thoughts? David, Curtis, Howard? I'll just throw out one other quick point. I think a challenge for libraries that are looking to, you know, shift this traditional collection spend from supporting, you know, closed access to investing in open access. It's not just about these open models. It's also about the open infrastructure. 
And that just raises a lot of questions for libraries who are not always in the best position to gauge where that investment, you know, should really happen. And so there's work going on with like the Invest in Open Infrastructure project with Caitlin Thaney. Um, but that's something I would really like to see in this open infrastructure space to support all these things we've talked about today, guidance to libraries on where we should be um, making these investments. I think it's really needed. Excellent point. Yeah, we haven't talked about technology investments or or vendors or or you know other kinds of things quite in that realm. And David, did you have any? I uh, I think I'd I'd close by saying uh, I think we need to look a little bit at what the South Americans have done in building a diamond infrastructure. Uh, I think uh, we've got to think. Uh, more about how uh, that might or might not work in different contexts here, uh, particularly uh, particularly in Europe, I think, uh, where I, the Commission have got uh, a platform approach, uh, which is a different, sort of different kind of diamond and, and whether that's something uh, to build on. I think the biggest challenge, I can't resist leaving without saying something slightly controversial, the biggest challenge is the US where uh, there's very there's moderately passionate support for very different models, and that seems to me quite different from virtually every other country where they're coalescing on the whole in in approach. Even even if you look at China and India, in addition to uh, South America, where it's sort of continent, uh, Europe there's a fairly common approach. Uh, uh, Canada too is, I think, uh, uh, going down on a, a on a fairly national approach. Uh, but at the heart, there's there's very very challenging uh, uh, situation in the states with different approaches, and not yet the engagement, in my view, uh, between funders and university libraries, which uh, has been tremendously beneficial in virtually every other country I've I've mentioned. Uh, now it might be the U.S. is just big and different, and that's life, I accept that. Uh, but uh, I think uh, quite a lot, uh, quite a lot could happen in the US that hasn't happened yet for probably quite obvious reasons. Super, I love closing with a little controversy because it'll lead into whatever our next engagement is. Um, well, thank you so much. Fabulous, uh, fascinating, insightful panelists, all of you. And Howard, I will hand it to you to wrap us up. That, that was a great session. It's been a really great day. Um, hopefully everyone that is on either a panel or attended has really gotten a lot out of today. I know I certainly have. Again, a very special uh, thank you to our sponsors, ACS, AIP, Wiley, AMS, Silverchair, and STM. And if you could um, fill out our poll, uh, Tara is gonna put it in the, uh, in the chat. So it does help us to plan for future events. It also helps Chorus plan on what it wants to do next. Um, I walked away with a lot of ideas, I'm sure Alex did too, out of, out of today's discussion. And um, this is not the end of discussions, but it just continues to be the beginnings of it. So um, there'll be a lot more coming from Chorus in the way of, of forums. And, uh, and once again, uh, thank you. And we'll be providing a summary of this, as well as we will also be providing the full video next week um, and we've had a request to include the chat, so we will certainly do that, and also the results of all the interactive things that uh, we were doing with you today. And so, so it was a really great day, and I appreciate it. Have a wonderful weekend, and uh, thanks.